So Don talked about choice, and he talked about delivering choice. And for years, the automotive industry has delivered choice through different ways to create metal, bend it, create physical structures, conform the physical structures, always running into boundaries in physics and the physical limitations, and then doing cool science and technology to break those limitations and create new limitations. Hats off, it's very, very cool. However, it's an exceptionally long process, and it takes a lot of time, and it takes a lot of effort. So how do we envision delivering choice over the years to come in this connected vehicle? It's through software. And so if we look at it, the software guys have been delivering choice for years at Ford. In 2011, we had about 25 million lines of code in our Ford Mustang. In 12, it was up to about 50 million. And we're estimating over 100 million lines of code in our vehicles as we move forward, all behind delivering choice to the customer. And for those of you that know software, right, you'll see the actual circles of hell, the potentially scary place. It's a pretty well-known graph of complexity and complexity management as you look at lines of software code. And as we're moving up the complexity lines with hundreds of millions of lines of codes into our vehicles, I'm here to tell you that it, it won't scale. We can't keep putting more and more software necessarily into the vehicle. We will, but that can't be the only way to do it. So how do we solve this complexity problem? How do we solve the choice problem for our customers? How do we solve the problems for choice when the customers that we're selling today were born with handsets buried in their hands? When all they've known from the day that they were created was this world of digital connectivity and personalized choice? How do we do it? So Don talked about that. The first part of it is smart device link. It is the ability to actually encapsulate the car and to expose it in well-known ways to third-party software developers, to allow them to allow you to integrate those things that our customers, your customers, demand. But it's not just smart device link. It's developers. It's developers who are doing the cloud. It's developers who are working embedded. It's developers who are designers. It's developers who sit there saying, hey, what if? It is people who are crazy ideas from past times saying, holy cow, this is a computer on wheels. It's the guys who are security conscious who are saying, hey, have you thought about it this way? It's the guys who are saying open and freedom is important. How do we achieve that? The car represents one of the most fundamental open aspects of freedom, as was talked about in the early 20s when Henry Ford said opening the road to mankind. How do we deliver it? It is the kinds of guys who inspire you and say, holy cow, those people look at the world differently. How do we tap into them? And last but not least, it's the kinds of people who today are building very exceptionally cool stuff and who have now taken notice that there's something happening in automotive and they want to be a part of it. Smart Device Link is OS agnostic. We've been talking about it. You'll hear about it later today. It is OS agnostic, but I bring out Linus Torvalds as the creator of Linux for the simple fact that as a marker of acceptance, the kernel team, kernel.org, is now taking notice of what's happening at the Smart Device Link project and are now looking to understand what they can do at the kernel level to enable better and seamless transitions. Yes, that's Linux. We don't all work in Linux. Some of us work in QNX. Some of us work in Green Hill. Some of us work in Microsoft. So, but it's a marker. The industry is taking notice and saying, how can we help? So what can we do? What are the cool things that we can do? What are you going to see and learn about today that should excite you? We've been talking about vehicle data. Here's just a small subset of stuff that you're going to hear about today. And I'm calling out my keys, very Ford specific, because I'm conscious of the fact that there are those of you in the audience today that don't just work with Ford. And we're cool with that. We acknowledge and understand that in order for this to be successful, your apps need to work as well in Ford as they do elsewhere. We know that. We understand that. We're getting better at understanding it. And we're getting better at understanding what we as Ford need to do to make that happen. So to Don's point, having conversations with our counterparts in the OEMs in Detroit and other parts of the world, making sure that we reach out and behave correctly in the aftermarket. But this is a sample of data that pretty much all the OEMs have, one form, fashion, or another. So imagine if you took that vehicle data and you added external data feeds, feeds that are possible because they exist already but are looking for a place at their home for developers to come look at. So take the IFTI, 
imagine you couple it with weather data and live traffic data. Those all exist today. On the left, we have vehicle data that exists today. We have services that exist today. If you guys could couple them together using smart devicing to pull that data off vehicles, here are some things that you could do. Watch this. If my kid drives within one mile of a home, school, or work, some geofence that the car doesn't even need to know about it because the phone and the offboards have known about it, then hey, I can send a phone, an SMS message, out to the parent. Hey, your kid's been, you know, his kid's made it to school. If my key, so this is a Ford specific feature, this is the idea of personalizing your car. Other OEMs have something similar. So the concept though is that I know no one, someone who's personalized is traveling. So I know my kid's using the car. So if I see the car being five miles over, or if I understand that maybe there's a belt alert, i.e. if I understand behavior of my child, I can then turn around and set a reminder to talk to them about their driving behavior. I can close the loop on how they drive. If I find out that fuel con may be above or below, the way you're driving, how fast you drive, how slow you drive, I might then be able to post on your social graph and bring a full picture to sustainability. I can use the vehicle and its data to create a better world, a better driver. If the oil life flows below a certain value, I can now interface with all the different things and be able to schedule at your preferred dealer, your preferred mechanic, and get you scheduled if the temperature outside is different, based on preconceived settings, I can condition the car. If there's traffic condition, so if I use Waze, who here uses Waze? A lot of you use Waze, right? How many of us are always checking it? Well, how cool would it be to be you know, told before we're leaving, right? You need to be taking alternative routes, right? How cool would that be? Or better yet, take the routes and they get rebought them back into the car. So the point of this is that all this exists today. And what you're gonna find out from now, from 11 o'clock on, is how to do it, It's how to build it. So the rest of today is about teaching you about our SDKs, teaching you about the head unit, teaching you about how to build the core, showing you how the project works in open. Uh, there's gonna be cool uh, conversations with some of the partners and some of the uh, business development folks that we have. And speaking of business development, I do need to give courtesy to Scott Brunell, you met earlier today. We were out visioning one day and he wrote this up. So your business development folks that are here today are here because they want to help you be successful because by helping you be successful, they help Ford and Ford customers be successful. And by extension, they help the automotive industry be successful. So we're excited about what's gonna to happen today. We're excited that you came and we're exceptionally excited about being involved. As Don called out, it's important for the automotive industry to have a hand in this exercise. Now, how does it work? How does this actually work? So Don talked about public commitment to building in public. How does that actually work? So some of you have heard me speak before, I'm always about the big circle of life, so let's, let's talk about this circle of life. So the OEM still has their business model. They still contract with their favorite and preferred tier one to build them, to help them integrate a head unit. And they stipulate for that head unit that they want SDL. The tier one's gonna pull source, the actual source code for that tier one. It's gonna pull it from the public project. The tier one's gonna integrate that into the head unit. Tier one's gonna deliver their production head unit like they would normally deliver. And then the OEM's gonna accept and validate what happens. Now what's cool about this particular model, when we're talking about the OEM and the tier ones, in the traditional model, the OEM just dictates to the tier one. But in this new model, the OEM can work in SDL. This is an open project. It's currently maintained by Ford. We are open to having conversations for others to come in, co-share maintenance, set it up to be different. But the key concept is there is no barrier to working in the code base of any kind. But not only can OEMs work in there, the tier ones can be putting stuff in there. And not only can the tier ones, but other parties. Part of our message today out of this open developer conference is to get people excited about working on what is completely open and completely available and to show you how to do it.